Charles Sanders Peirce lived from 1839 to 1914 and was one of America's greatest and most original thinkers. Among his many accomplishments, he developed the philosophy of pragmatism and the study of semiotics. He was a philosopher and scientist, an expert across an incredibly diverse range of disciplines. In order to develop his concentration in the study of logic, Peirce was a recognized polymath, a brilliant mathematician, astronomer, chemist, surveyor, cartographer, engineer, inventor, an experimental psychologist, historian of science, a mathematical economist, and a metaphysician. Yet his life was tragic in many ways. When Peirce died in 1914 at the age of 74, there were 12,000 pages of his papers published, but he had never finished a book. To date, less than half of another 80,000 pages of manuscript have been prepared for publication. Toward the end of his life, Peirce suffered illness, mental breakdowns, and financial ruin. His wife was continuously ill. He'd been rejected by the universities and publishers, and he was unable to complete many of his ambitious scholarly projects that represented his life's work. Fortunately, many of his published and unpublished manuscripts, letters, and other documents leave a picture of the man and a record of his troubled life and brilliant work. For Peirce, logic, or semiotic, was the means to meaning, the logic of science. It was the structure of thought, since all thought is in signs, and all knowledge was represented by it, regardless of the field of inquiry. Peirce defined semiotics as the study of signs. A sign is anything that stands for or represents something to someone. The concepts that explore semiotics evolve from the study of phenomenology, the pre-logical apprehension of the world, the essence of perception and experience. Imagine thinking of nothing but the color blue. Not thinking about the color or addressing questions about the experience, the idea would be to perceive one thing alone. This is Peirce's concept of firstness, the contemplation of the essential qualities of something, the color blue. But we cannot purely experience this before some secondness, a quality distinct from the blueness that you first perceived enters your consciousness. Perhaps something different or distinct from the original phenomenon. In relation to the foreground, a background appears as a secondness. Perhaps it could be a sound, it could be another color, or it might be an object that appears in the midst of that color. Something in a contrasting color that makes it distinguishable, that has characteristics such as shape. Finally, Peirce recognized that what you experience in your mind is thirdness, the mediation of signs that occurs as a mental process of your experiences, thoughts, or ideas. He called this an interpretant. An interpretant is a being with the potential to interpret signs. Peirce was involved with a project which he believed would provide the structure of the whole of scientific inquiry. He was exploring the possibilities of chance, the idea of the continuity of the universe, and a neglected argument for the reality of God his justification for scientific theism. It's very probable that Peirce was manic depressive, but during his lifetime this was not understood as a medical condition. His dramatic mood swings were characterized by periods of remarkable accomplishments evidenced by his brilliant prolific writing in contrast to his breakdowns and periods of extreme, even suicidal depression. Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman. But who is that on the other side of you? Brent interpreted a letter that Peirce wrote at age 65 in 1904 to a colleague reflecting on his accomplishments and limitations as a philosopher. He said, I am by nature most inaccurate. I am quite exceptional for almost complete deficiency of imaginative power, 
and whatever I amount to is due to two things. First, a perseverance like that of a wasp in a bottle, and second, to the happy accident that I early hit upon a method of thinking which any intelligent person could master. At first glance, the method he referred to was pragmatism, but on second thought the matter is not so simple because Peirce wrote that he had come to pragmatism from a logical and non-psychological study of the essential nature of science. The method begins, as Peirce explains, with a sign or representative, something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. It addresses somebody, that is, creates in the mind of a person an equivalent sign or perhaps a more developed sign. The sign is some expression, a word, sound, or an image that stands for its object or meaning. The sign or representament is the quality of a singular phenomenon or the firstness. The representament then stands in some way for secondness, the sign's relationship with its object or its essential or most basic meaning. Finally, the sign is perceived and creates an equivalent sign in the mind of someone. Peirce called that sign the interpretant, the sign produced as an idea in the mind. Peirce developed three categories that became the basis of a hierarchy for further triads of signs, icon, index, and symbol. Icons are understood because of some resemblance between the sign and its meaning. A drawing or painting or diagram of some kind will be understood for this reason. Indices are understood because of some causal or material connection between the sign and its meaning. The track or footprint of a deer, for example, is a visible sign for the absent thing that produced it. A flag blowing in the wind is an index for the direction of the wind. Symbols are signs that must be learned through culture in order to understand their meaning. A flag is a good example. Words are also symbols. Writing requires knowledge that allows association of a word to its object or meaning. Spoken words must be learned because the sound has no natural relationship to its object. Different languages will have different symbols for the same object. Peirce believed he had discovered a method of thinking, and as he said, it was one which any intelligent person could master. He said it was a great reservoir from which ideas of a certain kind might be drawn for many generations. But it was not such an easy method to master, a fact which puzzled him and often misled him into believing that his readers would have no difficulty in following his arguments. Brent observes that even his beloved and only true friend, William James, himself no slouch as a philosopher, never understood him. From the letter mentioned earlier, Brent observes that Peirce gave two reasons for his success as a philosopher. One was his method of thinking, and the other was a perseverance like that of a wasp in a bottle. The image he created of himself as an angry wasp trapped in a bottle, perhaps a nearly empty wine bottle, seems wonderfully apt as a description of the secondness of Peirce's experience of life. Toward the end of Peirce's biography, Brent concludes that the more Peirce's attention became drawn to the nature of the sign, the more the sign's mysterious power to embody the real became the focus of his analysis. Since all this universe is profuse with signs, if it is not composed exclusively of signs, and all thinking is in the signs that represent the real or other signs, all our experience, if we consider, 
is of the real. The real is instinct in us and the rest of the universe as signs. Peirce had indeed discovered a method of thinking which any intelligent person could master, a great reservoir from which ideas of a certain kind might be drawn for many generations. The logic of science necessarily questions how we know what we claim to know. Peirce's pragmatic maxim addresses this question. He asks us to consider what effects that might have practical bearings we conceive the object of our conception to have. These effects constitute our beliefs about the truth or reality of something and consequently influence our actions. In other words, the meaning of anything we experience in the world is understood through our conception of its practical effects. The purpose of semiotics is to make our ideas clear, to identify how meaning emerges through logical systematic method. In this way, Peirce's work lives on. Through his methods, we can examine the nature of our beliefs, explore the practical effects of our understandings of things, and interrogate the validity of knowledge claims.